जय राधा कुंज भी
Vasudevaya means I worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead whose name is Vasudev, who is situated everywhere. <laughs> it's actually the Maha Mantra in Dwarpura Yuga. And that was the main mantra for glorifying the Lord. So, Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 4, Chapter 28. Paranjan becomes a woman in the next life. Text number 25. Vrikshyamana prasabham Yavanena baliyasa Yavanena baliyasa 
Sinan Buddha Tamasavista Sakyam Suridam Puraha Vikshriyamanam Prasabam Yavanena Baliyasa Navada Tamasa Vista Sakyam Suridam Puraha Vikshyamanam prasabam Yavanena baliyasa Anvada tamasa vista Sakyam suridam puraha Prasabam, forcibly, Yavanena, by the Yavana, Baliyasa, who is very powerful, Na Anvidat, could not remember, Tamasa, by darkness of ignorance, Avista, being covered, Sakyam, his friend, Suridam, always a well-wisher, Puraha, from the very beginning. So King Paranjana, who was actually King Parchini Barhishat, this is an analogy that is being spoken by Narada Muni to awaken King Prabhupada Pr 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 
Pratini Bari Shat, yeah, okay. Um, and uh, this analogy is about his departure of the body, and that's what's happening right now. So this Yavana is actually fear personified. When King Paranjana was being forced, was, was being dragged with great force by the powerful Yavana, out of his gross ignorance, he still could not remember his friend and well-wisher, the super soul. Srila Prabhupada's purport. In Bhagavad Gita 5.29, Lord Krishna says, Bhuktaram yagya tapasam sarva lokam maheshadam suidam sarva bhutanam gyatvam mam shantam vichchati. Prabhupada's explanation. A person can be in full Krishna consciousness and become happy and satisfied if he knows just three things, namely, the Supreme Lord Krishna is the enjoyer of all the benefits, that Lord Krishna, he is the proprietor of everything, and that he is the supreme friend of all living entities. Hmm. So what were those three things? He's the supreme friend of all living entities. No, yeah, that was the third one. And what was the other one? Supreme enjoyer. Supreme enjoyer. Supreme enjoyer. Okay. And uh, the other one. Proprietor. Yeah. So he's the enjoyer. He owns everything, and because he owns everything, he's the enjoyer of everything. And but he's also the best friend of all living beings. <laughs> says, if you know these three things, you can be happy and satisfied. If one does not know this and functions instead on the Labali conception, that person is always harassed by tribulations offered by material nature. In actuality, the Supreme Lord is sitting by the side of everyone. Ishwara Sarva Bhutanam, Riddeshe Arjuna Tishtati. The living entity and the super soul are sitting side by side in the same tree. But despite being harassed by the laws of material nature, the foolish living entity does not turn to the Supreme Personality of Godhead for protection. However, he thinks that he is able to protect himself from the stringent laws of material nature. This, however, is not possible. The living entity must turn towards the Supreme Personality of God and surrender unto Him. Only then will he be saved from the onslaught of the powerful Yavana or Yamaraj. <clears throat> the word Shakyam, friend, is very significant in this verse because God is eternally present beside the living entity. The Supreme Lord is also described as Suhidam, ever well-wisher. The Supreme Lord is always a well-wisher, just like a father and mother. Despite all the offenses of the son, the father and mother always are the son's well-wisher. <coughs> Similarly, despite all our offenses and defiance of the desires of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Lord will give us relief immediately from all hardships offered by material nature if we simply surrender unto Him. <coughs> As confirmed in Bhagavad Gita, Mam Evaye Prapadyante, Mayam Etam Tarantite. Unfortunately, due to our bad association and great attachment for sense gratification, we do not remember our best friend, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Om Agyan Timidandasya Gina Jana Silakaya Chaksu Un Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guraveda Maha Namam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudavami Pacharine Nirvisesa Sunyavari Pasyatya De Satarine Panchakampa Trubhya Kripa Sindhu Paevacha Patita Nam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namah Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadara Shiva Siddhi Hora Bhakta Vrindh 
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Mm. So, <clears throat> everyone's looking for friends in this world as part of life. <laughs> and we make friends with various types of living entities who are similar in our way of thinking and in a way of living. It's called friendship. <clears throat> mostly in their way of thinking. We develop friendships by people who have similar natures. Marriage, it says marriage and friendship should be based on these things. That is, similar nature, similar likings. <laughs> nature is, you know, your characteristics or your, your personality. We all have personalities that are slightly different and sometimes radically different. <laughs> <laughs> And when you get, sometimes you get cross-cultural differences, it gets really radical. <laughs> but ultimately, that's how the foundation of these relationships are solidified in a positive way, when the nature is similar. So, therefore, when we make friends, we always look for and seek out those people who have similar natures, who we can resonate when we can talk to, we feel comfortable with, happy with, and we share similar likings and, and ways of doing things. <clears throat> That's generally the friendship in the material world. And <clears throat> it's explained that there are also another type of friend that is called a, 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 a what we call an official friend. <clears throat> People you somehow occasionally meet, maybe you're, you made friends with the shopkeeper who you go to the store all the time with. <laughs> you don't really share your personal life with him, but you, you know, hey, how you doing, you know, how's the family, oh, okay. You, know, you just kind of like it's official friend. <laughs> it's people we know, but we don't really get deep into it. So there is, <clears throat> one is called Mitra, one is called Bandhu, and then there is Suhit. <coughs> Suhit is Krishna. <coughs> that means that person who is actually the real friend of all living entities. Because when you talk about friendship, you have to say that what that person who has your interest at heart, and that's Krishna. We make friends in this material world, and sometimes there is that overlap of interest, but generally, we come together in order to gain something in that relationship. And that's the way that w things do work in a material world. We make friends and we make relationships in order to fulfill our needs for these, for relationships, for, for, uh, for, for getting things in life. But Krishna, he is a different type of friend. He, he has no need from us, but still he's our best friend. He doesn't look for anything from us, except that we uh, uh, somehow or other understand him and try to follow him. And then he opens up his friendship completely. And he's called Suhit. And so this verse that's referred to here in the very beginning of the purport, uh, it says that that friend is an ever well wisher. <laughs> Srila Prabhupada, when he would uh, sign his letters to his devotees, he would end by saying, I hope this meets you in the best of health, your ever well-wisher, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. <laughs> he would always sign that, ever well-wisher. A person who always has your best interest is hard. And then when we understand what is our best interest, it's that uh, those things in life that bring us happiness and satisfaction, fulfillment. And then when we come, when we understand that even deeper, we understand when the ultimate principle of happiness is love. <laughs> love, to exchange loving relationships with another living being in a way that is satisfying and pleasing. Of course, love means satisfying and pleasing. And uh, selfless also. So Krishna is selfless. He's always trying to see how he can direct us towards him. 
give you an example. Sometimes people say, well, if God knows past, present, and future, and he knows what I'm going to do in the future, then, you know, what's the idea of, you know, a relationship? Because he knows everything that I'm going to do, and so I'm already, you know, destined to do certain things. It's already there in the, you know, the hard drive. <laughs> But actually it's not like that. Krishna knows what you're going to do in the future. And if he sees what you're going to do in the future is going to bring you away from him, he tries to change you in the present to bring you back t towards him. So his knowledge of the future really is his way of dealing with us in the present. To, make, to move us away from what will eventually inevitably happen if we continue in the same way. <laughs> so that's uh, that's how he works. He's actually a friend in the real sense because he knows if there's something that is inauspicious or something that is going to be harmful, both for our spiritual life and material life also, he will try to in some way indicate to us through the material energy, through another person or some way, way or maybe directly in the heart that you should move away from that, and he'll he'll move us in a, another direction. So where do you get a friend like that? <laughs> He's always looking for your welfare, not only in the present, but he can also see what is beneficial in the long run for us, which is, of course, uh, our relationship with him. So that's Krishna. <laughs> and he's so kind <clears throat> along with that, that uh, when we do something, he helps us to do it. And it says, he says that in the uh, in the Srimad Bhagavatam in the sixth canto, <clears throat> the nineteenth chapter, he says that uh, <clears throat> whatever you need, I supply it. <clears throat> he gives he says, Sarvasya Jaham Ridisani Visto Matat Smitri Gyanama Pohanam Cha. I give you knowledge if you want that. If you if you want to forget me, I, I help you to do that also. That's for the materialists. The devotees don't want to forget Krishna. So he doesn't fulfill that desire for the devotees. But for the materialists, that's what they want. And he also gives knowledge and remembrance. That's Krishna. And he also says in the Bhagavad Gita, Rasoham uh, Apsukuntaya, Prabhasmi sasi surya, pranava sarva vedeshu, sabdike purusham nishu. The last line, sudike surake purusham nishu, means all your abilities, that's me. I am the ability in all living beings. So whatever you can do is simply coming from my, you know, my mercy. He's supplying everything the intelligence, the facilities, the arrangements and ultimately the ability. And as, as he does that, <clears throat> although he's giving everything, as soon as we connect with him, we're aware of that. He's giving it anyway, whether we can understand it or not. But when we connect with him, we're re we realize that. He gives the last thing, he gives the results. In other words, <laughs> Prabhupada used, would say, <clears throat> just like devotees would ask Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada, when you were, when Lord Chaitanya was here, he took Krishna consciousness throughout the entire Indian subcontinent. Practically, he made the entire country of India Krishna conscious when he traveled for six years, leaving Jagannath Puri and traveling all the way down to Cape Cormoran, coming back up and crossing back over into Puri. Took him. Yeah, six years to, to travel. And he spread the holy name everywhere. And thousands, millions of people were chanting the holy name wherever he was going. So he practically made the entire subcontinent of India Krishna conscious. And then the devotees asked Prabhupada, well, Lord Chaitanya was here and he made practically all of India Krishna conscious. Why didn't he just spread it around the world? Why did he stop in India? <laughs> and Prabhupada said, well, he left it for me to do. 
<laughs> Lord Chaitanya could have did it. It would have been really easy for him. That's no problem. <laughs> He's all powerful. And uh, all powerful really means that there is nothing he can't do. He can enter into your mind and make you think in a different way. That's, uh, that's his power. He <laughs> If he wants to, but he doesn't do that. He leaves our, he gives us our independence because he don't, doesn't want to interfere with that. And, and so when we do something, and he supplies all of the ingredients that makes the activity happen, and then he also gives the results. And he says, oh, wow, that was nice. You did so nice. <laughs> In other words, he, he's everything. But at the same time, he gives the credit to his devotees. Prabhupada said, he'll appear in a dream and say, my temple is not working very nicely. It's broken down. So please you know, repair it. And then the devotee will get fired up to do that and, and then start working. And Krishna will help supply everything they need to do it. It'll get done and then he'll say, wow, you did a nice job. You fixed my temple. <laughs> And other people will say the same thing. Example. <clears throat> when Krishna was in Dwarka, this was right after the battle of Kurukshetra, uh, he was going to the assembly meetings of all the seniors in Dwarka. And Yud King Yudhisthira had also come to be with Krishna. And there was plans to have the Rajasuya sacrifice, which was required in order to establish King Yudhisthira on the throne in an official way. And to do that Rajasuya sacrifice, it took great wealth and at least two years to put it to, put the, to accomplish the whole sacrifice. So Yudhisthira was there, and Krishna was there, and it was an assembly meeting, and they were discussing different management schemes for Dwarka at the time. And during that one meeting, one man appeared at the door. He was a messenger, actually. And he was stopped by the security at the door. And uh, he gave a letter to the security. He said, can you give this to Krishna? And uh, so he read the letter. And then he alerted Krishna. He said, there is actually an emergency here. to see This man is coming on behalf of the kings that have been imprisoned by Jarasandra. Uh, Jarasandra is going to perform a great sacrifice to the goddess Chandi, a human sacrifice, and kill all of these 10,000 kings who have been imprisoned by Jarasandra. And now they're praying to you, my dear Lord, please save us. <laughs> Only you can save us. We are in a very difficult situation. Our lives are about to be destroyed by this demoniac king. So... Krishna listened to the letter, it was very heartfelt. And then the decision was, or he, Krishna had to make a decision. They were there to discuss the Rajasuya sacrifice and to put that together. And now this other problem came up. So what to do? He, Krishna had, because Krishna was meant to be the supreme honorable personality and the Rajasuya sacrifice. King Yudhisthira said, you, you should be the guest of honor and everything will center around you for this sacrifice. So Krishna agreed. And now this other situation is Jarasand is there and he's, he's, he's about to kill all of these kings who have surrendered to Krishna at least. Jai Shri Shri Jagannath, Baladev, Subhadra Maharani, Ki Jai, Gornitai, Ki Jai. <clears throat> and so, Krishna has to make a decision what to do. So, Krishna's cousin is there, Yudhava. And Yudhava is Vasudev's brother's son, so he's Krishna's cousin. And he's also a great devotee. He's an associate of the Lord. He associates with the Lord. He travels with the Lord also. 
So Krishna said, Uddhava, what should we do? <laughs> Obviously Krishna knows what to do. But he said to Uddhava, what, what should we do? And Uddhava said, well, he thought for a while. And he said, my dear Lord, as long as Jarasandra is alive, the Rajasudya sacrifice will not be successful. So our first business is to eliminate Jarasandha. Everyone said, Jai, Uddhava, beautiful, perfect decision. King Yudhisthira was so happy and Krishna was smiling, although Krishna knew the answer already. <laughs> but he, he deferred to Uddhava just to glorify Uddhava, to show that this devotee is actually very, very surrendered, very dear to me. So Krishna did, did that, and Uddhava, Uddhava got all the credit for making the decision. So that's how Krishna works. So he empowers his devotees to do things. He sets up the facilities when we make an effort to do it. And he gives the intelligence how to do it. And then when the results come, you get the credit. Although he does everything. <laughs> That's Krishna consciousness. So you might not think, well, you know, I'm doing it. Not really. Because <laughs> it says in the Bhagavad Gita, there are five factors of action. <laughs> and one of them is you. <laughs> the other four, one of them is the time, the place, the ingredients, and the endeavor. And then, of course, the super soul. And all of these five ingredients are there in all actions. And we're just one fifth of everything we do. <laughs> all of these other things. Just like I'm giving a class, but if there's nobody here, <laughs> what's the use? You know? <laughs> so you allow me to give a class by being here. <laughs> so, so the ingredients have to be there in order for something to happen. So one cannot arrange everything. One tries to arrange things, but one it always falls short because we we don't have that c capacity. But Krishna knows how to do it, so he he does everything. Prabhupada says, if you want to do something and you've been doing other things, and you kind of that other thing it slips your mind, you can't remember it. Then while you're doing the other thing, and you still want to do that, Krishna will say, oh, you wanted to do this. So he'll appear in your mind and remind you, this is what you wanted to do. You ever had that experience? All of a sudden, what you wanted to do comes back all of a sudden. That's Krishna. As he says, I am remembrance, I am knowledge, I am forgetfulness, I am the ability in all living entities. So these are the elements of the best friend. So even if we do something wrong, or we work outside of, of morality, civility, uh, values, or even Krishna conscious, still, if we somehow or other realize that the only solution to my problem is to take shelter of Krishna and to surrender to him, what does it mean to surrender? What does it really mean to surrender? You, you hold a white flag and you walk around. <laughs> I'm surrendered. <laughs> it's not exactly like that. Surrender actually means a moment-to-moment -moment consciousness of depending and remembering the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Moment-to-moment. -moment. You can be surrendered one minute and the next minute you can be unsurrendered. <laughs> And then the next minute after that, you can be surrendered again. <laughs> so it's a consciousness of always depending on the mercy of the Lord. Depending on the mercy of the Lord means to understand that we are jiva, we're limited. We are, unless we are a pure devotee, unless we have reached the stage of pure devotional service, we're still covered with four faults. Imperfect senses, makes mistakes, uh, 
becomes illusioned and cheats. <laughs> These are the four defects of the conditioned soul. And only the pure devotee is free from these four. Mm -hmm. And they work in sequence also. Our senses are imperfect, and therefore we become illusioned. When we become illusioned, we make mistakes, and then we try to cover our mistakes by cheating. <laughs> it's a conditioned soul. Does that, that's how the conditioned soul works. Because the senses are imperfect. Perfect senses are spiritual senses. Our material senses are a covering over the spiritual senses, which are our real senses. The material body is just an ephemeral dress of the soul. It has substance, but it's just a covering over the reality. It's not that we have two senses, we don't have, we have spiritual and material senses. Our senses are spiritual, but they get a covering, and that covering is called material. Our mind, the pure mind of, a, of, the, of the living entity, is constantly associating with and serving the Supreme Lord in devotion. When that mind starts to associate with the three modes of material nature, these modes are like coverings, Jai. She see Jagannath Baladev Subhadra Maharaj Gwanitai Ki Jai. These coverings just block our pure consciousness and therefore we act under the influence of the three modes of material nature. So surrender means really to depend on the mercy of the Lord and to remember the Lord in each and every situation. That's why there's a very powerful verse it's from the Padma Purana. And it's, it, it's somewhat of a rhetorical verse. It says, What is the greatest mistake? What is the greatest misfortune? What is the greatest anomaly? Mm -hmm. These are the three things it mentions. It's begging the question. What is the greatest misfortune, mistake, anomaly. And then it answers it, to forget the Supreme Personality of Godhead for one moment. Hare Krishna. <laughs> the soul cannot forget the Lord. <laughs> but the material mind is chanchala. When Krishna told Arjuna, and you just control your mind, Arjuna had an understanding of the nature of the mind. He said, Chanchala Mahamani Krishna. Chanchala, uh, what was that? Chanchala Mahamani. Chanchala Himi Krishna. Palava Dridham Tasyaham Ridayam Vayur Idam Suduskaram. Chanchala Chanchala means flickering, unsteady, moving everywhere, going this way and that way. Try to keep your mind in one place, right? <laughs> it's like you're listening to the class, but you know, you're, you're somewhere else every once in a while. <laughs> What's Prashadam, per what do you have to do later, what happened last night? <laughs> so, you know, the mind is always going somewhere like that. Die. So the steady mind means to focus on something that doesn't move, and that is the spiritual essence. Everything spiritual is stable. Everything material is always moving. And so when we connect our mind to something that is fixed, then our mind gradually, as we practice controlling that mind, and Krishna gives the formula after Arjuna makes that statement. He says, you're asking me to control the mind, but I think you're asking me to control the wind. It's impossible, Krishna. The wind, my mind is unsteady, turbulent, and it's like trying to control the wind. And Krishna says, yeah, that's true. <laughs> But there is a way to do it. And then he answers in Abhyasena Tukuntaya Vairagya Chagriyate. He says, by constant practice, 
and detachment from sense gratification, one can control the mind. So two things he gives. Practice connecting your mind with Krishna always. Devotional service, activities of devotional service. And stop looking towards the material world for happiness. <laughs> <laughs> We're always thinking, you know, everybody's failed to become happy. Not me, I got it down. I'll get it right. <laughs> I know how to become happy. <laughs> I, be I understand deeper how the material energy works and so my plans will work. <laughs> we don't consciously think that thing, but we still, still exploring that desire to become happy in this material realm. And what Prabhupada very emphatically and very directly says that spiritual life begins when we stop looking towards the material energy for, for happiness. He says that's the beginning of spiritual life. Because we can't become fixed in our Krishna consciousness. And so Krishna is always there for the devotee reminding us. When things go wrong in our life, it's actually Krishna's way of teaching us that what we're doing is you know, against our own best interest. So that's, he's, in that sense, he's the friend and well-worship also. Just like if you have a friend who always tells you how nice you are and how everything was wonderful and how so many you, have, you have so many good qualities. But when you do something wrong, he doesn't say anything or, you know, let you go on with your, all of your bad habits and mistakes. That's not a real friend. <laughs> He's just trying to be, you know, patronizing the relationship. So you like the person because they agree with you 100%. But a real friend will say, hey, you know, what you're doing is really Maya. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm saying this because I like you, <laughs> and I care for you. <laughs> so uh, maybe you should consider. Because we can't see our own faults. We can see some of them. We can't see everything. But that's what friendship is about, to help another person. Marriage is also like that. <laughs> in fact, you get an overdose of that in married life. <laughs> Hey, <laughs> you forgot my birthday. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right, I did. But I'll get you next year. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I'll give you two presents, one from this year and one from... <laughs> so, yeah, well, the married life is a little different. But friendship is in, in the sense that is a, a good friend will also help you when in the time of need and how also Ganga help to guide you and that's Krishna that's Krishna he's always there to move us away and give us sometimes a little slap <laughs> when we get out outside of the you know out of the proper mood and proper activities but that's his mercy that's his mercy and it says here he's like our father and mother that Despite all of our offenses, still he, he, he doesn't see that. As long as we come back to him and depend on him. And then Krishna wants to help all living entities because he loves all living entities perfectly. But the living entities in the material world <clears throat> don't go to Krishna for help. They go other places for help. They go to their own intelligence, their own abilities, their own plans. They're always trying to solve their own problems or fulfill their own desires by their own efforts. And sometimes they take help from other people who are like them. But only when things get really tough, when things fall apart in people's life, then they run to God. And yeah, sometimes they say there's no no atheists in the foxholes. Foxholes means when they, in battle they used to dig these holes and the persons would fight from these holes. They were called foxholes. And so <clears throat> when you're in a war, you know, it's a different thing. Your life could be expended in any second. 
So you're more inclined to call out to God for help. Because <laughs> there's no, no one else around. Oh, of course, you depend on others also. But, but when we depend on Krishna, we are depending on someone who is all-powerful. He can make a difference. And if he wants to help, he helps us in different ways. Sometimes we want something. And what we want is good, but he's saying, what you want is nice, but you're going about it in the wrong way. You're doing it, you're approaching the whole thing in the wrong way, so he'll help us in, in that way. Just like if we, uh, you know, we want some pizza. So we think, um, all right, <clears throat> I'm gonna go and I'm gonna make some pizza. But then you might think, well, I want some pizza, but I'll just wait till it comes. <laughs> and somebody cooks some pizza, and if Krishna wants me to have the pizza, I'll be there right at the right time. <laughs> so we depend. So you might think, well, is Krishna my pizza man? <laughs> is he going to supply me pizza? Then we think, uh, well, yeah, whether I have the pizza or not doesn't really matter. And then we give up the desire, and then after some time the pizza comes. <laughs> There's a trick in life. If you actually don't want something, but you actually need it, but you don't try to get it, you'll get it. <laughs> but when you try to get it, sometimes you get it, and sometimes you don't get it. Sometimes when you get it, it doesn't give you what you expect. Just like one senior devotee was telling me, <coughs> And this is a feature of our ISKCON movement. Uh, he was very qualified, very senior devotee, very intelligent, <clears throat> many, many good qualities. So they asked him to become a member of the GBC. And he's, he gave many reasons why he shouldn't become. <laughs> and he gave this reason, that reason. I'm not qualified. I don't. So there's so many reasons he was giving away. And then they discussed it and they came back and they said, you are very qualified because you don't want the position. <laughs> you're actually qualified because you're not trying for the position. Therefore, if you get the position, you'll not try to take advantage of that position for personal interest. That's how it's done. So. Well, Krishna will also see that in us, that when we actually want only Him, and if we don't even want anything in this material world, even if we need things in this material, they'll come. Krishna will come, He'll give them to you. Because you're surrendered to Him, you say, oh, this devotee wanted this, but they're not, all right, I'll give it to him. Just like I tell people, some people say, well, I gotta find a wife. And they're looking and can't find a wife. I said, stop looking and just surrender to Krishna and then he'll send you one. <laughs> and it happens. <laughs> like that. Usually happens the other way with the ladies. And they say, I gotta find a husband. But there's all the guys out there, they're all useless, you know. <laughs> so how can I find a good one, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so but then I say, oh, then I say to him, you know, just depend on Krishna. Just, just increase your bhakti. Don't forget about this idea of husband. And after some time, they say, oh, Krishna sent me a nice husband. Happens a lot. <laughs> it's just the way it is that Krishna likes to serve his devotee, and he knows what his devotee needs on the material level either. But simply by surrendering to Krishna in devotion, sometimes we make a little effort to fulfill our material needs. But when we, when we compromise our devotional service to somehow or other fulfill our material needs, then we're actually taking ourselves away from our best interests. I've seen that many times. Oh, stay fixed in devotional service, no matter what's happening, no matter whatever else is there in material life. And by Krishna's arrangement, everything will work out nicely. Because Krishna always wants to serve his devotee. 
He always provides everything the devotee needs. And even if you want something and you don't get it, it doesn't really matter because you didn't need it. <clears throat> but when you find Krishna, it's better. You think, oh, I wanted this, but now I'm, I'm happy in my service to Krishna. Ah, eh, that's not so important anyway. <laughs> and then it comes anyway. <laughs> Some of, you, you're, some of you are laughing because you had this experience. It's a, it's a fact. So just stay fixed in devotional service. Try to surrender to Krishna. And where we, we spend so much time problem solving. But the best way to solve problems is to please Krishna. <laughs> if we do that by chanting the holy names, by associating and serving devotees, by reading the books, by understanding the practice of the Krishna consciousness, and all of our problems are solved gradually. <clears throat> they, they either go away by higher knowledge or a higher experience, or they, they actually become fulfilled by Krishna's arrangement. And that makes life easy. So just focus on devotional service. Chant, you know, whatever it takes to become Krishna conscious. Take care of your personal needs, but don't make it your main goal in life. <laughs> it's not so important. Just like, <clears throat> I hate to say this, but I don't, I don't work, but I still get food to eat. <laughs> I don't have any house, but I have a place to stay wherever I go. <laughs> I don't have any vehicles, but I can always, <laughs> I always get around somehow. <laughs> so it's, and that's true. Now it's not just well. You say Wallace and you ask, you say got all in. No, it's true for everybody. <laughs> if you simply serve Krishna, He fulfills all your personal needs through the process of devotional service. You don't have to worry about these things. And that's because he likes to serve his devotee. And he, we should always remember that, that Krishna, Prabhupada would always say that, what can you give to Krishna with two hands that he's holding with ten? And what can you hold with ten hands that he's giving to you with, with ten? <laughs> so Krishna's always, he, the competition between the Lord and his devotee. The devotee is trying to serve the Lord, and the Lord is always reciprocating in so many ways. And who wins? Krishna. <laughs> He's always better at it. <laughs> so we don't have anything to just stay fixed in devotional service. And we have some, if we have problems, make a little effort to rectify the problem. But when we get so involved with our problems in life, and then we actually lose our focus on where the real happiness and real solution is. I'll give you an example. I give you two examples. One example. <clears throat> the uh, this was back in the days when Srila Prabhupada was here. Uh, the Philadelphia Temple in America. So the rent was due. $250 at the time for, they were renting the building. And so there was no money. In those days we had hardly any money. <laughs> there was no congregation. And whatever money we could get, we were selling some back to Godhead magazines, some incense. Or if some devotee came to join the temple, we asked them to bring the money. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we got money in those days. <laughs> and so, you know, there was no congregation and the devotees were all full time. <clears throat> so there was no money. <clears throat> so the temple president thought, let's all go out on Sankirtan. So he took the whole temple except the Pujari out on Sankirtan. So they all went on Harinam Sankirtan. And while they were on Har Harinam Sankirtan, one very nicely dressed gentleman, in suit and tie, very, you know, pucka looking personality, he came up, he came to one of the ladies who was there, and he had an envelope. He said, I want to give this to you. So he meant to the devotees, so he gave it. He smiled, 
thanked the devotees for doing Harinam, and walked away. Nobody ever saw him again. And in the envelope there was $250, just enough for the rent. <laughs> Do you believe in magic? <laughs> Malati and Shamsundar and uh, the devotees of the early days in 1967, they had this little house in uh, San Francisco, Berkeley area, and the rent was due the next day. No money. So they're walking along the street. It was kind of an empty street. They're seeing, talking about how they can get the money. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, $100 bills were flying in the air. <laughs> yeah, Malati tells this story. Well, they, wow, and they start picking up these $100 bills. Nobody was around. <laughs> this money was just flying in the air. So, do you believe in magic? <laughs> These are extreme examples of how Krishna works through his devotee. But in general, if we stay fixed in devotional service, make a little effort to take care of our personal needs and not a big program, then uh, everything works out nicely. I was just reading. Anyway. Oh, this, somebody sent me this today on, on my phone. It's a statement. It's interesting. Let's see. This is, this is Prabhupada. Prabhupada said, Actually, chanting of the holy name regularly is our life and soul. And on the basis of such activities, all other devotional services will sustain. <laughs> That's from Prabhupada wrote that letter to one lady, her name is Ekayani, February 10th, 1970, Los Angeles. <laughs> Actually, chanting of the holy name regularly is our life and soul. And on the, on the basis of such activities, all other devotional services will sustain. <laughs> and we put the holy name first and everything follows nicely. And that's true in general, not only with devotional service, but within life in general. <laughs> okay, so Krishna Suhidam Sarvadehinam, Suhidam Sarvabhutanam. He is the friend and even if we've made so many mistakes in life, we did so many bad things, and we have so many apparent difficulties, if we simply take shelter of Krishna, pray for his mercy, and engage in his devotional service, all of that will be overshadowed in due course of time. Prabhupada said, you may have been a murderer in your last life or some part, even in this life. You come to Krishna consciousness, you cut your finger. So what he's saying is that you get a small token from your material activities when you engage in devotional service. And that sometimes material activities, all the reactions of material activities stop completely. And there's no more karma coming in, no more karma going out. And that's when a devotee state is, becomes fixed in their devotional service. So devotional service, especially the chanting of the holy name, is the panacea for all ills, all problems, everything. Everything is there in Krishna consciousness. And Krishna is there to purify the devotee, to guide the devotee, to instruct the devotee, he does it through the material energy, he does it through the spiritual master, he does it through the other devotees, and he does it directly within the heart. He's always with the devotee, always, always helping the devotee at every minute. There isn't any break in Krishna's relationship with his devotee. Any questions? Comments? <laughs> 
Yes, Damodar. Thank you much for wonderful class. In the beginning you mentioned how Krishna knows the future and he will engage with in relation to when we have a relationship with him. And my question is we we hear that in the spiritual world there's no time factor and as we know it here. So how here Krishna knows everything. Yeah, he knows when you're gonna go back home. He knows everything. He knows whether you make it in this life or not. But he's always working to help you make the right decisions. Mm -hmm. As soon as you change your way of thinking and doing, you change the future. The present is the foundation for the future. Mm -hmm. So Krishna is helping us. Oh, he'll he'll tell you, you know, through through the different avenues of information, that he, don't do this, or he's giving you a little reaction for the wrong act. He's teaching us, moving us away from things that'll take us away from him and bring us closer to him. But he he won't do it. He'll simply help us make the right choice because we have to make that choice. He won't force us, but he will help us make the right choice. He does that in so many ways. Just like uh, I, we preach in jail, so, uh, and many of the people that I talk to and who are prisoners, inmates, <clears throat> they say, this is the best thing that ever happened in my life because I met God. <laughs> I, wouldn't have, I probably wouldn't have been a devotee if I didn't go to jail. Yeah, they say that. They're actually serious when they say that. that and I, I met the devotees, I met Krishna consciousness, now I, I'm, I'm finding you know, the way of life that is, that is making me happy. even though they're in jail. So they, they're, shy, they're saying that this apparent negative experience in life, wrong activities and punishment and confinement, actually led me to Krishna. <laughs> of course, we don't want to go that route. <laughs> but, for those who did, and then eventually come to Krishna, they, they're thankful for coming to Krishna eventually from the way that they, that life unfolded. So Krishna will somehow bring someone to him in different ways. <laughs> You just have to be aware of that, that's all. <laughs> so he doesn't do it, but he helps us do it. <laughs> he reminds you, don't do this, do this. <laughs> he works through the intelligence. If you want to find where Krishna is giving his message through your intelligence, not necessarily the mind, the intelligence is a feature of the mind, but it's the, the feature that connects us with Krishna. The intelligence. Jiva Goswami makes that point. It's the intelligence that connects the soul with the Supreme Lord. It's through the intelligence. And therefore we have all of the means to develop that intelligence which will connect us to Krishna. That's why Prabhupada would say, use your intelligence. <laughs> and Prabhupada, someone would say, well, Prabhupada, I don't have any intelligence. Prabhupada said, then get some. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like, oh, I don't have any intelligence. No, it's not an excuse. Then suffer. <laughs> What is the feature of intelligence? Determination, discrimination. 
And these are the two qualities of the intelligence. Discriminating between what to do and what not to do, what is right, what is wrong, what is favorable, what is unfavorable, and determination to carry out the favorable. Mm -hmm. That's the feature of the intelligence. Mm -hmm. The mind thinks about something, gets a feel for it, does it or doesn't do it, depending on whether it likes it or doesn't like it. Mm -hmm. The mind can get us in trouble. <laughs> And therefore, one has to use the intelligence. Intelligence comes from Shastra. Intelligence comes from Guru. Mm -hmm. Intelligence comes from our experience in devotional service. Mm -hmm. Give you an example between the difference between the intelligence and the mind. <coughs> Maybe if you had this experience, <clears throat> you're standing high up in a building and you're out on a balcony and you're looking down, it's way down there, and you're just sitting and the mind says, jump. <laughs> the intelligence says, no. The mind says, that girl, wow, she's really nice. And the intelligence says, she's got a husband. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Now, the mind will leave out the, you know, the, the mind will feel in a certain way and sometimes lead us in the wrong direction. But the intelligence is there to check the mind. You've seen the example in the Bhagavad Gita. The chariot, that one picture, there's a chariot and there's two people on the chariot. And everything is an analogy. There's five horses, which are the senses. The reins is the mind. The driver is the intelligence. The chariot is the body and the passenger is the soul. <laughs> So the driver is the intelligence, he's holding the minds, which are the, the, the reins, which is the mind, directing the senses, which are the horses. And the analogy is a beautiful analogy, it's perfect. So we apply what we hear from Guru, Sadhu, Shastra to how we live life. If you use that pattern, then everything works nicely. And then sometimes you need some discrimination to understand how to apply intelligence in a particular circumstance. And that's where we have association with devotees and we can inquire and learn practically how to apply the intelligence in each and every cir cir circumstance. So Sadhu Sangha is actually the foundation by which intelligence develops. And reading the books too. Of course. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Yes, Mataji. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. So I, I just wanted to share something uh, because you were speaking about how Krishna always provides everything for us so that if we depend on him and just perform devotional service right. then everything will come. Sometimes when you say that to <laughs> people <laughs> they say oh it's empty ver words or you're living in an illusion or don't be so fanatical. <laughs> so what would you say? I mean to such a person I mean if we get such response or, or some fear, or they say, no, it's not Krishna, it's this and this person that you have in your life, they are the ones who are providing, not Krishna. Well, Prabhupada clarifies that. He says, no one can help anyone unless Krishna empowers that person or inspires that person to help. He says it in a different way. He said, no one can do good to anyone unless Krishna wants it to happen. So Krishna is in the heart 
He's the super soul. He's, he's directing everything <coughs> from within. <clears throat> and so if we don't have faith in Krishna, then we have to depend on something that is fallible, which is people in this world, situations, our own abilities and in our own understandings. But if we, we need to use our intelligence, our facilities, our abilities, but ultimately the last part is depend on the mercy of the Lord. So we don't simply throw out the idea of thinking, discriminating, depending on others. We do all that, but then ultimately the ultimate dependence on for the success is Krishna either sanctions it or doesn't. Either one. He is the sanctioning principle. And he says that in the Gita. Where is that? Yeah. He says, in all circumstances, just depend on me. But still, you have to act. He told Arjuna, you have to fight. <coughs> But your fighting is not the cause of the uh, victory. He said, fight for the sake of fighting. Not, not, not ha -ha. Fight for the sake of fighting. What did he say? You're not the cause of happiness, distress, victory, defeat, honor or dishonor. He said, fight for me. So it comes back to that principle serve the Lord <laughs> and everything works out. But if we want to serve the Lord and serve our senses at the same time, then we may also get a partial result. <laughs> Krishna says, You approach me, I reciprocate according to how you approach me. If you surrender completely, I'm with you 100%. If you surrender 80%, I'm there 80%. He's there 80%, but he's still trying to tell us, you know, you got 20 more percent to go. <laughs> <laughs> so he doesn't stop there. <laughs> so people will think like that because they think in terms of, you know, uh, practicality. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Krishna consciousness is very practical. <laughs> Just like um, you fly in an airplane, and uh, do you know the pilot? <laughs> Have you met him? Do you know his qualifications? Well, you understand, because he's the pilot, he has the qualifications. The airline is authorized him to do the work. So you have faith that that will work. Is that practical? <laughs> it's not that you go up to the pilot and say, well, you know, how many times have you flown before? Have you had any close calls? <laughs> Do you know how to land a plane? Let me see your certificate. <laughs> you don't do that. So we have faith that Krishna will take care of us. And Krishna says he does. So that's practical. <laughs> this is as practical as you can get. <laughs> Impractical means to put your faith in something that is that is fraught with, you know, deficiency. They're asking, asking me to do, to take a chance and you use the material energy, which is always changing and not dependable, to, to carry out something. There's like this person who created the there was a sewing machine. You've heard Mr. Singer, Singer sewing machine? Goes back maybe, you know, 60, 70 years. Mr. Singer was trying to make a sewing machine. And he was trying to make sewing into a machine type of operation. 
He couldn't figure out where to put the hole in the needle so it would work in the machine. And he tried and he tried so many experiments and they all failed. And one night he went to sleep and he had a dream and in the dream the answer came. <laughs> put the hole in the head of the needle. <laughs> so he got the answer in the dream. <clears throat> not by his practical, he had the desire, because he had the desire, that, that made his desire manifest even on a subtle level. But who's giving, the, who's giving the results? Another person? There was no other person involved. <laughs> yeah. But Krishna is telling us every minute, do it like this, don't do it like this, you know. If you chant your rounds, you know, make sure you, uh, you know, chant in an area where you can concentrate. In other words, Krishna is using our intelligence to dictate to us what we, how we should, how we should live, how we should practice. Both practice, he does that even for the materialists too. They want material things and he also helps them fulfill that. At least to some degree, depending on their karma also. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have faith in Krishna, then where are you going to go? <laughs> Krishna says, yeah, I am the source of all material and spiritual world. Everything comes from me. The wise who know this engage in my devotional service and worship me with all in their heart. <clears throat> he, he, he declares his situation. <clears throat> always. He always tells you what he does and how he does it. <clears throat> we can't see how he does it, but he's always telling us how he, that he's doing it. Is he a liar? <laughs> or is he just, you know, making sophistry, half truth? How much faith do we have in, in Krishna? There's so many examples. Devotees been saved from death so many times simply by remembering Krishna in a very difficult situation. He was there to save them. I can cite at least two or three examples off the top of my head. But the point is that, yeah, he tells us, you want remembrance? That's me. You want forgetfulness? I help you. You want, so the actually, what we have is desire. Krishna, we have desire. He doesn't interfere with that. He gives you a choice how you want to live your life. You can desire this way, that way, this way. You can choose so many. There's 8,400,000 different desires in the material world. <laughs> in the spiritual world, there's only one. <laughs> Devotion to the Lord. <laughs> so people who don't know the Lord, who don't worship the Lord, who don't understand the Lord, they, they'll, they'll always opt for the material as the way to go. But we don't neglect the material, but ultimately we depend on the Lord. We don't say, well, I shouldn't use my... Prabhupada said, use your intelligence. Krishna told Arjuna, you got to fight, but your fighting is not the cause of victory. <laughs> it's me. But still, if you don't fight, then there will be no, you know, then I cannot fulfill that desire. You have to do it. He won't do it for you. We got to do it. We got to try to do our best. We use a little, little, I don't know what they call it, a little aphorism, <clears throat> sutra. It says you have to act like it depends on you, and you have to know it doesn't. 
sounds contrary. But that's, that's how we live life. You have to act like it depends on you and you have to know it doesn't. Depends on the... We can't make the results happen. Not possible. If we did, then everybody in the material world would get everything they want every time they do something. <laughs> and there's so many intelligent people out there. I mean, there's big brains out there. Super. There are people who are really intelligent out there. But their intelligence is materially oriented. They can do many great things from the material perspective. But Krishna is allowing that to happen. Because of their karma. Their karma pushes them in a certain direction. And because they have a certain kind of karma, they have a certain intelligence to carry out their karma also. That's also Krishna. <laughs> So for us, we don't have to worry about, we don't have to make big plans. All we have to do is try to surrender to the Lord, engage in devotional service. But Bhakti Vinod Thakur said, if you want to do something, make some effort in that direction, but don't make big plans. Spend so much time just working on material things. This is good advice for temple presidents, too. <laughs> if you emphasize <clears throat> chanting of the holy name and uh, taking care of devotees, you'll find every, all of the projects will work nicely. Do those two things. Just set up a, a whole system of devotee care. Every devotee care it gets everything they need whenever they come. And uh, chant the holy names. Everything else, Krishna will provide everything else automatically. Service is the divide to the Vaishnavas is the highest form of service. <laughs> Don't think that the temple president shouldn't think, well, I'm, in, I'm the temple president, everyone should serve me. <laughs> no, you have to be a servant no matter what position you're in. <laughs> And you carry out your position in a mood of service. And that's how we, a guru serves his devotees in the mood of helping the devotees, not so they can gain position as a spiritual master and get all kinds of garlands and <laughs> prashadam and eulogies and nice comforts. No, all the, our mood is service, 100%. Because that's all we are. We can't do anything else. Because that's our nature. So successful management is take care of the devotees, make a, do that, do that a hundred percent, and have as much kirtan as you can. <laughs> and follow, you know, take care of the deities. That'll be that'll be there also automatically. If you take care of the devotees. The deities will get all the care they need. <laughs> As people will come forward to do the service. When you take care of the devotees, the devotees want to, want to, want to do more and more service. They want to surrender more and more. So I'm not saying you're not doing that. I'm saying this is the foundation for all success. <laughs> As leaders, that's our main concern, is the devotees, how to serve the devotees. And of course, people in general by preaching. Mm -hmm. yeah. We try, <coughs> we're not perfect. <laughs> but if you try, Krishna gives you the intelligence.